And then this track is walking up this way. It has some bobcat potential. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us on Across the Fence. I'm Jolay Whitney. Today we continue our look at the University of Vermont's natural areas by exploring the newest addition, Joe's Pond. Let's join Ben Willis who ventured out with the UVM research team to track wildlife activity in the area. And even though the tracking conditions aren't great because sun has hit these tracks, we can't really see any accurate footprint detail. I can visualize that there was an animal standing here and so I know that it wasn't a deer, right? I know that it wasn't a coyote. We're looking at something fox sized. We are tracking wildlife at two UVM natural areas, where a student researcher is setting up camera traps with guidance from tracking expert Sophie Mazawita, who teaches at UVM. So we saw some fox tracks, uh, Virginia opossum, and some striped skunk on the way in here. And now that we're at the forest and wetland edge, we can hope to maybe find some animals that uh, stick to more forest cover. So that might include fishers, river otters. I'm really curious to know if they're occupying the ponds and the wetland complex here, maybe a bobcat. Joe's Pond is the newest addition to the UVM Natural Areas System. The pond is named after a veteran of the American Revolution, Joe and his wife Molly, Native Americans who made this area their home. According to local legend, during a harsh winter, the small community of Morrisville was at risk of starvation. Joe tracked and hunted a moose. sharing the meat with his fellow settlers and ensuring the community's survival. Joe's Pond wouldn't be part of UVM's natural areas without the landowner who donated it, Ron Stancliffe. I've always had a love of the land. I just felt it was another great place for kids to learn. Another thing too is I'm trying to educate the public about the value of conservation, and by doing this, maybe it'll encourage others to be more involved with conservation. Because then it's, will this fit around that tree? Kylia is a UVM student working on a project that uses trail cameras to study wildlife across several natural areas. So this semester, last semester, I have been camera trapping with Jed Murdoch, and we are trying to find out what animals are here in the natural areas. Currently, the natural areas, there are 10 of them. So we've been going around and we've been using cellular cameras so that all the images that we get can shoot straight to our phone and we can see in real time what animals are there. Kylia's trail cams at other sites have not yet captured any wildlife. That's where Sophie Mazawita comes in. An experienced tracker, she offered to help Kylia search for signs of wildlife and find the best spots for her cameras. Wow, it is so bright. <laughs> Ideally, when it comes to placement, when you're just looking to aim the camera at a game trail, normally what we're doing is trying to hit that trail at a 45 degree angle. So if the trail is here, instead of angling it at a perpendicular or straight up and down the trail where you just get like lots of butt shots <laughs> or just real quick passage. If you aim it at about a 45 degree angle, right, hit you that trail more. at an angle, it makes for nicer looking shots. There's lots of tips and tricks to consider, certainly looking for junctions of wildlife trails, right? Just looking for high activity areas and looking for trees to place the cameras there. Uh, avoiding any especially windy spots where maybe blowing branches or blowing vegetation are going to be causing what we call false triggers and causing footage to be taken of just plants blowing in the wind. Uh, and then otherwise, sometimes placement is about wanting to yeah, capture cool specific to behaviors. Yeah, I, I think the goal here is to just get a snapshot of who's in the area. Uh, but for instance, if I want to try to locate otters on this landscape, I'm going to be looking for latrines, areas where they come and poop and leave their scent on the ground. And so I think we'll have our eyes out today for any of those high activity areas and those wildlife communication areas. But definitely shorelines and habitat edges, like where wetland meets forest edge, can be fantastic places to pick up on a big variety of wildlife activity. As we move along the edge of the pond, 
Mazowita spots something promising. I haven't picked a very good spot. I'm going to do this. Without sliding and destroying the evidence. <laughs> there we go. Mazowita has spotted what may be evidence of an otter. You know, I saw this about foot wide trough in the snow, punctuated by deeper markings. And so this is where an otter is pushing off to slide across the snow. They love to slide on the flat. This is an old slide. Maybe it's just kind of weathered out, but we've lost track detail in here. But we do have relatively clear otter tracks showing up all through here. So this marking, we've got this marking right here. This looks like the hind foot of an otter. They have uh, their innermost toe, what you could call like their, their thumb or big toe, like on their hind foot is set pretty far out from the other toes. There's webbing between those toes, so it helps them to swim. So that's clearly identifiable as an otter track. And my hope in following it, one direction or another, is that we'd end up finding a spot where they're actually leaving their scat. And we can see that right there. It's out right at the water's edge. There's the otter scat. Oh. Out on what's probably an yeah. old beaver lodge. But you can see this network of trails through here. What a cool spot. Yeah. And it's not just about leaving their poop, right? This is about them communicating that they're here. It's this. Uh, this communication system. So they'll leave their scat behind, but they also roll around and they uh, use the scent, uh, scent glands in their feet to deposit all kinds of scent messages at their marking areas. The team sets up a camera trap near the otter slide, hoping to capture footage of the otters in the days ahead. They recommend low and or aggressive downward tilt. I know. Those, that's usually the secret to success. With the camera in place, we head to our next site, another UVM natural area, Mali Bog. This protected ecosystem isn't open to the public. Sticking to its perimeter, the researchers follow a trail left by a coyote pack, hoping it might lead them to signs of other wildlife. We found uh, not necessarily the camera spot, but we found a new species, tracks. We've been following in the footsteps of a coyote pack here. And we've just been noting that there's a pair of tracks real tight together here. And then there's this gap and there's another pair of tracks. Some of these are really sunned out. Uh, you may also notice that these tracks are really standing up or sitting up atop the snow. So we get the sense that this was a lighter animal. Footprint this size, coyote. This looks distinctly different than yeah. our coyote tracks, right? But let's just put coyote on our list as a foot this size. It's really similar footprint size. Really just like looking at that track size, looking at this movement to inform uh, our identification of this animal more than anything. So got any ideas, Kylia? We could think bobcat. We could think bobcat. That short stride here is a clue uh, of short legs. Uh, the oval shaped track, it's broader out towards the, the front where I can see some toe markings here. It tapers a little bit towards the heel. The pads are kind of indistinct. I'm not seeing a clear triangle like I did on the coyote track and then I do see an arc of toes. And so at this size, uh, I actually quickly narrow down my list to one, but you might be considering, yeah, any of those animals we just saw are just named. Here's fox, marten, which is a very rare yeah. species for us. Raccoon, now I'm not noticing any fingery quality and raccoons are heavy enough that they'd probably be sinking into the snow a bit more. I'm actually missing the card that has this species on it, but is it Fisher? it's Fisher. Notice that the foot size is about right. These are left and right front tracks that have actually been covered up by the hind tracks. Fishers have larger front feet. Energized by the possibility of more predators nearby, the team presses on following the coyote tracks that led us this far, hoping they will take us to a high traffic area. I don't know who this is coming where up. signs of other wildlife might emerge. It's a nice tea. Decent size, yeah. These trots, that's the typical movement for coyote. And then this track is walking up this way. Has some, bob, has some bobcat potential. It's a little windy. 
uh, it's hard, like the track's just obliterated, yeah. but, but we're looking at these three feet and we're imagining what animal is standing on those three. There's a bit of a pigeon toed, like inward pointing quality and a rounded look to this track. It's got a, this is the heel back here. So it's a shorter heel than our coyote track. Uh, and there is a bit of asymmetry to the tracks. And so these are all bobcat features. The team decides that this intersection is the perfect spot oh, to yeah, set up like, their final I camera. Can do that. At this spot, Kylia applies a scent lure, just a small amount, but enough to catch some attention. Let's try not to spill. This stuff is potent for us, right? So it really doesn't take much to no, draw like, wildlife attention. I think it was great to have the professional guidance and being able to place it based on those tracks. And this looks like a place that doesn't have a lot of people traverse and it looks like it could have some wildlife here. So having actual concrete evidence that wildlife has been here and being able to identify what wildlife has been here is really important and has been really impactful. With the cameras in place, it was time to head home. Kylia hopeful that this methodical approach, guided by a professional tracker, would finally yield results. The next day, I got an email from Kylia. The cameras were already delivering. At Joe's Pond, a raccoon. At Molly Bog, coyotes. Even a gray fox, clearly drawn in by Kylia's scent lure. But then came the jackpot. A fisher cat. The results kept coming. A week later, over at Joe's Pond, the raccoon returned, this time with friends. And just hours after that, an otter rolling on the ground, leaving its scent, just as Mazuita predicted. Kylia's efforts, guided by Mazuita's expertise, had paid off. For the man who conserved this area, the dream was simple. Let students learn from the land. And in just a few days, for one UVM student, the forest delivered. Raccoons, coyotes, a gray fox, an otter, and a fisher cat. Thanks to Ron Stancliffe's gift, generations of students will have a similar chance to research, explore, and discover in this remarkable natural area. At Joe's Pond, I'm Ben Willis with Across the Fence.